I start? I have no idea. <laughs> does it, how does it go? Um, hello and welcome to Romance Writers Therapy. Where to, buddy? Oh, you're, you're, do it. you're a monster! <laughs> Why am I so helpful? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the first 30 seconds is just last, a slap at <laughs> The first 30 seconds is us dying. <clears throat> we are now dead. We're on a ship and, or like a little two person robo, and I just sunk on the side. Yeah. talk about editing woo and why it's such a bitch i like editing uh actually let me see we had a specific title we were gonna use yeah a sexy fine tooth comb a discussion about editing so sexy (laughs) no it says some sort of discussion on editing (laughs) be accurate (laughs) yes i'm sorry i'm sorry past and future me i have embarrassed us all Editing is such a, it's such an undertaking, and it's like, you have to put on a whole different brain. <clears throat> I am sorry, listener. Um, I just wolfed down, like, some pizza at an alarming rate, and so now I'm drinking tea to try I to not be so phlegmy. <laughs> <laughs> I, for a moment, I thought, wow, your dog's getting really vocal. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the most unflattering thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> I realized as I said it, wow, that was actually me. That is so, no, you're good, you're good. Not funny. Yeah, I mean, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, I retract that. It wasn't quite, like, canine. Okay, I just saw, okay, I'll have to tell you about this TikTok another time, because listener doesn't have to know all my TikTok shenanigans. Oh, um, okay. Well, now you've made them curious. Okay, listener, gosh darn it. Uh, There was, like, a stitch where this lady was, like, spelling your name backwards as a beautiful man for your daughter. And then, oof, I know. And then the woman, (laughs) the woman was, like, stitched to herself, obviously. And she's like, my name is Kara. And then she stitched to a dog going, (laughs) ugh. Okay, this this lady, she sees, um, I promise, listener, we're not just going to talk about our favorite TikToks, but she does that, like, really, you know, all over the internet trope of one day you're going to meet your soulmate, and it's the first word they you hear them say will be the word that's written on your wrist, and it's a word that appears there when you're 18. So she has her 18th birthday, and she gets this word, and it's like, kind of like a key smash, and she's just like, what? And so she goes through life so lonely, trying to find someone who will say this unpronounceable set of letters to her, okay. and then, then like, eventually she stitches to, like, a video clip of a dog making that noise. Oh. <laughs> and, and she's like, my soulmate. Aww. I mean, it's a good soulmate. Dogs are great. Okay, so listener, you tuned in to uh, to have a conversation about editing. Yes, we did say we were yep. going to talk about that. Yep. And, but unlike our, our books, we don't really edit the podcast. We think we're hilarious every time we talk, so. We don't edit the podcast. We don't. Kate does. <laughs> no, I, that makes it sound like I'm mad about it or something. I enjoy editing. I'm glad podcasts. because I could not do this without you. So. <laughs> okay, so like Kate said, it, it takes a completely different set of brains to go from writing <laughs> to editing. And currently, I am like super in editing mode and will be for like the next couple months. Gosh, I feel like the first half of this year is just me editing and like very mm-hmm. little writing. And that's a bit much because I do like editing, but. Yeah, because it is such a different. Like, I know we just said it's so different from writing, but it is so different is. from writing. It is. Like, especially when you're doing large projects. Yeah. I think you're really shifting into, like, a whole different mode. Yeah, because, like, editing, like, you know, 15,000 words, that goes pretty fast. And there's just so many words you can mess up and have to redo. But, you know, when you're staring down the barrel of, you know, fifty to 55,000 words and plus, you know, like, my, my stories tend to be somewhere around 55,000 words. So pretty short as far as books go. Well, I would say they're still kind of longer than, say, category romance. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they're solidly in the novel arena. Yeah, they're like scraped. They're like so, like hanging right between that because uh, like just a sidebar in, in know your genre sidebar. <laughs> you know, it's good to research what the average like traditionally published mm-hmm. work count is if you're going the traditionally published route. I think it's also good to know for indie published things. I do too, but there's definitely more leeway there, and there's. There are a lot of particularly indie authors that make a very sustainable career on smaller novels, like around the, the well, length. So that's exactly it. <clears throat> you want to self and you're dropping like a 300 word story down there, you might, I don't know, I don't want to say scare off readers, but I feel like a lot of people who really consume a lot of unpublished stuff, they get a lot of short stories mm-hmm. and they're just consuming them constantly. And like a 300,000 word count would be something more geared towards like fantasy, like epic high fantasy sort of thing. It would. I mean, you could write a romance that long. You could. I think you would have to I can't think of what the right home for that would well, be off the top. Well, I mean, I would feel like that's kind of similar to the Outlander series, like her book sizes. So I think, I think she doesn't consider it. Really? I think I read that. They song. get marketed as romance. I think, well, no, I don't think they're marketed that way either, but I think they get shelved in mm-hmm. movies a lot. And I think a lot of people recommend them, you know, even though it's like, eh, it's not really. It, yeah. <laughs> Because I'm, like, trying to, like, remember if they always have an HEA. And I really can't remember. It's been, like, it's been too long since I've read them. And I fell I off. not. <laughs> well, I read, I want to say, like, the first five or so. Damn. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I definitely read more than Ugh. that. I stopped reading. Yeah, those are long books. They are long. I think I read them all via Audible. You know, they are long, but they're really good for, like, doing things while you're doing other things. Like right now I'm re-listening to yeah. the Wheel of Time series and they are all very long, like 50 hour books. And this read through I'm reading at 1.3 speed. Mm-hmm. And I'm really, I'm I'm glad I'm reading it that fast sort of thing. You know, like I feel like the, <laughs> the readers are fantastic, but um, I don't need to read Isn't it at one. Truck? Yeah. Man, we weren't right off. We were like skating around talking about anything. <laughs> Yeah, I've read a lot of those books, but it's been so long ago that I just cannot remember exactly what's going on. Like, how strongly it fits the romance category. But there's definitely a lot of comparisons based on beats. Oh, you know what? My mom was like, because the Romance and the Beat one came out, and she loved it. Totally loved that, that episode. And then she was like, what is a beat? So when we say... <laughs> When we say beat, we mean like plot point, right? The beats are like the drum that's moving the story along. I would give plot points as sl- like, I think you're right in that it's more like the drum. I don't know that I would characterize it as a plot point. Okay. You know, like I told you about that massive overlaying and smushing together of every single type of... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Beat sheet, beat sheet probably, slash plot yeah. structure mm-hmm. thing that I've ever come across into <laughs> one document. <laughs> As if I could just, you know, put enough of those together and I'd have a novel right there. I mean, congratulations. That's the idea. You've done the work. (laughs) Thanks. There's like four. (laughs) Like four different structures. Anyway, but one of them listed specific moments of like when the plot should occur, which I always thought was very interesting. Like Because there's... At 33%, it's like, you know, 1% you should have the inciting incident, and at 20% you have leaving the um, normal world, and then it's like basically what flips your main character's world upside down. Mm-hmm. 75%, it's like you cannot introduce any more new information. Everything is just about tying things up now. Okay, okay. But then it's like at 60%, you need to have your last plot twist. Wow. It, it was very specific to like when you have to inject plot moments. Okay. Or things that spur the plot forward. So what would you call a beat then? I would say beats are kind of, they are a little bit plot, but they're also a lot of emotion. Question mark, question mark, question well, mark. Well, there are a lot of emotion um, in romance because like romance is so character driven. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, I don't really know how to describe a beat then. <laughs> so... <laughs> I mean, I think of it, it's, I feel like I end up tying my plot points to the beat. Uh huh. But I think a beat is kind of like stages of emotional connection. Is the 
context of Gwen Stacy's book. Gwen Hayes. Oh my god. Who's Gwen Stacy? I have no idea. <laughs> it's a great name, though. Someone should use that That's name. Spider-Man's girlfriend. My bad. <laughs> no wonder I didn't know. I don't watch Marvel. <laughs> so. Okay, but back to editing. <laughs> yeah, we were going to talk we were. about it, mm-hmm. editing. You're going to have to um, just... Do you want to... What? Go ahead. No, no, you, you, you say the thing you were going to oh, say. Okay. So I was just going to... I will of... interrupt you for once. <laughs> Or twice. Okay, now go. Wait, now go. <laughs> like, no, no, you. After you, after I you. insist. Um, uh, I was going to tell everyone, listener, a bit of my process. Does that sound about right for editing? Process sounds good. Okay, all right. Little fine tooth comb, yeah. For one thing, my first drafts are really messy. They will have scenes that should be there that aren't. They will have half scenes where my note is like, just finish this later do better right and so my um uh, characters might not have names until the last chapter that had been present in the entire book my first drafts are very messy so before i can send that to a beta or anybody i have to go through and do a round of edit so i like to get the first draft done and then i really do like to let it rest for at least four weeks you know because in that four weeks i'll realize not only the scenes that have to be finished but also scenes that should be there because i kind of write stories at a really fast pace not that my writing is fast but the pacing of the story is fast that a lot of times instead of writing too many scenes i don't write enough and so i'll have to go back and inject scenes to kind of allow the reader just a little bit of a breath (laughs) But also to strengthen characterization, strengthen the plot. And then I send it off to betas. And usually in that time, I'm kind of thinking about what I think is wrong. But betas are great. There's always something I know is wrong, but I can't find the answer. And it's usually with the beta process that somebody gets me a lot closer to that. Now with Just Fake Married, our friend Mika Reiki, she is beginning to do developmental editing. And you have to. What? I'm me. Oh, I got to say Katarina. Well, too. but I think that, okay, so Mika is Katarina, but as a editor, <laughs> as an editor, she's going to go by Mika. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Yeah, we just keep, like, spilling people's secret identities yeah, exactly. on this. We're not, don't tell us your real don't name. Don't tell us folks. your real name. If you want to. We will. Yeah. Put your information out on the internet. It's probably best just not to be our friend. You know, that's probably yeah. the best way to go. So, but she did a really good job of like evaluating the book and where the plot needed to hit some of the tropes of like the fake relationship and stuff like that to strengthen what was there. Um, and then I went chapter for chapter and wrote a little outline of what I need to accomplish in that chapter to correct the plot issues. And that's been really fun because I, as a pantser or a discovery writer, I a lot of times am like, am I moving their emotions in a good way or not? And I'm just kind of like spewing things. So having it all laid out like step for step has been really nice to know that like their arc is happening in a really nice way. So that's that's me. Now I have to do it. And that's where I'm at. What about you, Kate? What's your process? Uh, oh, good question. It's been a while. <laughs> You know how, like, one of our, our writing friends, um, Rebecca Cox, uh-huh. she does this thing where sometimes she shows this chapter, and so sometimes in the middle she'll have, like, she, a note to herself that says, describe his hair. It's going to be fluffy as hell. Whatever. <laughs> and, you know, like, she said, she like, does. it sounds it's very so much like her talking pattern. And she's just cool with having her drafts like uh-huh. that because she knows she's going to come back to it. But I know I cannot, I will not find... A note like that. I know that note. If I put a note like that in, it it, it would make it to the the published version. Um, I have those weird brackets that I do. You know, like those archaic brackets, listener, that like have the point in the middle. They're very swoopy, and we really don't use them at all. But they're still on the on the keyboard. I use those around notes like that to myself, so I can do a search and find them, I correct those notes. More just- are they used in math? I think it's a mathematical. Well, they're archaic to me, and I don't know why anyone would use them other than my purpose. 
I mean, I know why you use them. I just wouldn't use them on a I also use, like, footnotes. And um, so I'll make sure that when I'm going through and cleaning that I resolve any notes to myself there. But I also know that, like, our friend Lillian Lark leaves notes to herself. But Kat Geraldo, she also can't do messy drafts. Like, hmm. she was saying how... Yeah, messy drafts, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. She, she's like, I don't, I don't know how you guys can just leave notes to yourself. Like, I feel a panic just thinking about it. Yeah, no, I don't like doing that. I feel like if I'm going to write a chapter, I need it to be, I need it to flow out of me as clean and neat as if it's the published version. Oh my gosh. I am just stressed thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> because like, there are so many times where I'm like, I just need to move on. I have spent too much time in this moment. And if I do not move on, I will walk away from this. Like the longer I take there, the more it feels heavy in my brain. I mean, same, but like I have to dig in and I have to fix what it is now or I know it'll just sit there and fester. I will actually give this advice to people. I'll be like, just go with a messy draft, you know, just put words on the page. It's fine. And like internally, I'm like, it's not fine. Don't do that. (laughs) Don't listen to a word I say. I lied to you. This is going to be terrible. I'm <laughs> lying to you. Um, that is really no, funny. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm lying. <laughs> because you have told me like, yeah, just put a pin in it. It's fine. Right? Because <laughs> that's your system. I know it'll work it for you. It does work for me. Do that. Yeah. But like, and you know, I think I actually told you this advice when you were like, oh, I'm having trouble with this. Because mm-hmm. I had read, I think Talia Hibbert posted this on Twitter. She had said something like, Sometimes she's writing a book and she realizes that, you know, this character who's been kind of dragging for her, maybe it would be funnier if he was French or whatever. Oh, that's hilarious. Instead of going back and, you know, rewriting the character's French, Uh like going through all those chapters before she can move forward, she just puts a pin in it and then moves forward as if she had already put in the changes. And to me, that's insane. I can't do that. Um, I (laughs) I was like, it's such a great idea for everyone else. I totally do that. I've never done that with, like, a character changing to French. Like, I think that was just her example. Yeah. But, like, I've totally done major plot point changes and been like, okay, I'm just going to proceed like that's been done and just continue on. See, I'm having a problem with that right now because I'm at, like, the climax of my story. Yeah. And I'm like, I should change the main villain. Yeah, that's right. Oh, so you're <laughs> stuck. Like, even though I do, I do like this idea because it's such a huge change. I'm kind of still on that precipice of should I? Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of like, should I go back to the beginning and work my whole way through the story, or should I just try to write the climax with, with the new villain? Okay. <laughs> even though I have, I have no idea like what her deal has been up to this point. Uh huh. You know, like I feel like I need to have those blanks filled in. Like I need to have every step of the equation written out in order to finish it. Okay. So the way I would do it in your situation is continue on, like. I wrote the new villain the whole way. Um, And if there's anything I don't know about her, I would just pick a cliche, throw it in there, knowing I can change it later after I'm going through and doing my editings. So like, to me, it's okay for her to say something like, like totally cliched and monologue or something along those lines, because I'm not going to leave it there for the finished draft. My writing relies so heavily on editing. Mm. That's how I would, that's how I would approach it. So what are you going to do? I have to have a finished product. I think what I am going to do is I am going to go back to the beginning. How how do you have a finished product, though? Because you still approach editing very seriously, right? So, like, you, you will make a lot of changes to your stories. I'm having a cost of good issue in my brain, right? Okay. Where you're putting so much pressure on this first draft, but you embrace that, like, editing is still going to be a huge part of your work. How does it work in your brain? Editing becomes kind of smaller because I'm putting a lot of the work that is editing in during the first draft. Okay. And even though you're not supposed to do that, it makes me feel better about having a more complete story. Like, I don't know, when I show you guys a, sh- a chapter mm-hmm. and then I realize that I have an unfinished sentence or something, like I just didn't come back mm-hmm. to it. That's like such an embarrassing moment. I'm like, oh my God, you see up my skirt. <laughs> You were not supposed to see that. You know? <laughs> Don't mind the man behind the oh curtains. My gosh. <laughs> Very. And it's just, it's bad. I feel like I'm coming off like such a perfectionist asshole. I, I wouldn't like, say asshole, but definitely like you, it's coming off perfectionist. Like, but like, that's okay if it's, if it works for you, if it doesn't stop you from getting work done. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I also feel like when people talk about doing like eight drafts and I'm like, 
how? What are you doing <laughs> that requires eight drafts? I could not even... Because, like, I don't know how to come up with, like, how many drafts I do. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, and, like, there, I've been thinking about editing a lot as, like, the first draft you wrote... You drew a map. And so one of the limiting things about editing is now you are stuck inside this map. And there are just... Like, that's kind of the way I think about, like, your Saltwater Heart book is, like, hmm. you've made a map before you knew how to draw a map. And so get rid of that map, redraw the map. Does that make sense? Like, that, to me, just redrawing the map, just rewriting the book would be less constricting than trying to edit what's there. I feel like what I'm doing is, I feel like I have to explain it in, like, Photoshop terms. Okay. Well, I mean, I won't, I, I might not get it. But you, please explain. Well, so in Photoshop, um, you have layers, which is very different from, I guess, like paint or any, you know, like a basic program. Okay. Also, like, you know, you worked in Canva, you know? Okay. You drop different images on top of each other, but they are all distinct from one another. Okay. And they are, they're layered. And so if I think of my book as all the different parts, so then there's like, there's the romance aspect, there's the hero's backstory there's the heroine's backstory there's each of their antagonists or uh various subplots each of those gets a layer okay okay does that make sense? yeah it totally does it's just more interwoven i think than simply stacking things on top of each other yeah like the transparency is set differently based on what um what needs to come to the foreground yeah so uh, when I have a finished draft, of, like I when I, I can either beginning, middle, to, like I have all the word count is a whole functional story on its own. Mm-hmm. And now maybe I just need to play around with refining some of these layers or I need to pull this layer out and I need to pop something new in or to add a bunch of new things that flesh things out. And I think I kind of place a lot more weight on those things in editing because it's it's much more I think a, a developmental kind of way of looking at it mm-hmm. because it's like how does this affect the overall story does it support it enough does it bog things down where's that in the pacing stuff like that yeah yeah because like once I'm getting to editing it's really I think about the structure of the story because I have so like I have it all if I just cut like a chunk out of the middle I can swoosh the things in the Mm-hmm. The, the the other pieces all together and I uh, that reminds me of another another piece of advice for actually like writing your first draft I've heard is like doing it in strings so it's essentially like what you're describing so if you have like your plot point of like the romantic element you would write all of the scenes for the romantic element and then if you have your plot point for the heist you would write all the elements of that And then whatever other plot points you have, you would then weave them together in editing. You feel like that kind of still doesn't quite register with me because I'm like, but the plot has got to influence the romance. Exactly. Romance has (laughs) to influence the plot. So you can't just write them and then mush them together. That was going to be my argument is like, I grow concurrently. Well, and like, I could see it working for like, like the Wheel of Time series, right? Like you have all these different characters moving within this world. They each have their own, like, plot and arc in each book, right? So I could see it working in that scenario to sit down and write all of this character's story, all of this character's story, and then, you know, cut and paste those chapters where they have to go. Because they, yes, what they're doing is affecting the series overall plot, but they are not working they are not connected until they actually are in the same scene together and so so and so might hear of what's happening in this region of the world and not know that that's their friend that's like accomplishing those things they don't have to happen at the same time no they don't and i think but i think the idea is that you're you have three separate arcs that are all like not three but you know you have a number of separate arcs and they're all building towards something I mean, there are so many different arcs happening. The, the, these books really are fantastic for looking at, like, storytelling. <laughs> uh, he does mm-hmm. a, they I have quite a few criticisms. And I think a lot of those come from the fact that, like, you know, they started publishing in the early 90s. But, like, as a whole, like, okay. this is really good storytelling. And they are very complex. So in that scenario, I could see writing out the strings. But 
for like the kind of books I write, I couldn't see writing out the strings. I think because I don't want to make it sound like romance is less, but mm. I think there is a lot like a lot less emphasis on having a complicated plot. Yeah. I think if you have an uncomplicated plot, then you are still perfectly fine yeah. because all the weight is really on the relationship. Yeah, the re- the relationship and the mm-hmm. characters themselves. So, I think so having a sparser plot makes it kind of harder to write out the string of that plot mm-hmm. without like, doing it all together. Cool yeah. Also, like, yes, it's it doesn't need as much plot, but there are still certain things. You're still working within quite the glass case without breaking it any like you can you can mess around with some of the the restrictions but there are certain things that like you have to give to your readers or it's not a romance right yeah i think we do need to do an episode that talks about we want to talk about premises i think at some point Mm -hmm. but i also wanted to talk about i really wanted to delve into the idea of what a Chekhov's gun is Mm. and you know i think a lot of people think it's only one thing in a story when it's like actually you have like maybe 10 yeah (laughs) even like little things are Chekhov's gun like the story you and I were talking about with like the rickety elevator like just mentioning it meant that it is a Chekhov's gun it doesn't have to be a big thing but it it, it has to play a part now in the story that we were writing together that I think we scrapped I mean at this point (laughs) we can I don't know I'll read through it and uh I'll tell you if If it's like, okay, that can stay where it's at. Or if we should come back to it at any point. It's hard to write in tandem. It is. It's really hard. Christina Lauren does it. Well, I know. And then also, like, like we were just discussing, like, our processes are so different. Right? So, like, I I could, like, totally, like, drabble out a chapter and be like, yeah, I'm okay with this right now. You know what I mean? And then your chapters are so much cleaner. I'm like, crap, I gotta put more effort in. Like... (laughs) Uh, I had, like, three different thoughts that were going off in three different directions. First one was just, it aggravates me that, like, people don't consider, like, when, when people put something into their book and you're reading, you're reading it, and then it feels like that is a promise that went unfulfilled mm-hmm. because you didn't come back to this thing, which I felt like you were waving a flag around, mm-hmm. like, this is gonna come back later, and then it didn't. Yeah. So it's, yeah, like, even on small things. Like, it has to resolve in some way, even if it's not the way that it typically does in most books. And then the second one was, we wanted to talk about Knives Out at some point and just take five hours. I know, right? How could we ever make that a tight 30? Ramble (laughs) about how much It will have to be a series. And, like, all the good (laughs) And then even just talking about, like, okay, and then I was watching this YouTube video. And, like, I've spent a lot of time with that. That story. I'm gonna rewatch that one. It's yeah. so good. God, yeah. We, we should rewatch, rewatch it too. together. We should. We need. To, I don't know how we'll do. I that. don't know either. Maybe this weekend we can. Uh, it was Andrew's birthday weekend. Oh no! <laughs> it's also my birthday weekend. Happy <laughs> Pick birthday! Me over your husband. <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, so, oh, I remembered my third. Okay, thought, but I gotta finish my second one. Um, between Knives Out. And Wreck-It Ralph 1, those are the only two movies I think I consider perfect in structure. Hmm. Well, you definitely look at... I have seen part of it. But I definitely feel like you look at um, plot... You're really... You're... One of the things that you've said about Knives Out that I just loved was there isn't a minute in that movie that isn't doing something. Right? Like, there isn't... Oh, yeah. It's so efficient. It's so efficient. And I thought that was such a great way to, like, praise that movie. <laughs> um, so I couldn't I couldn't say, like, this is a perfect movie because I feel like... Like, I couldn't give you another example of, like, the two you've given. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I, um, I might be a bit more of an emotional watcher than you are in that sense. I mean, b- believe me, Wreck-It Ralph made me cry. <laughs> well, no, not saying that it you're not... It was emotionally satisfying, but, like, it also tied up all his plot points that's awesome now i'm now i'm like just going through the catalog of my brain of like movies i was like that was really well done and just seeing like where i'm at on them you know what i mean um it's been a while since i watched fargo but like the movies but i think fargo is also i have never seen fargo it's good you would enjoy it i think i would i've always been like turned away from watching it 
because of like some of the dark humor and just like I love dark humor, but I still empathize too much with uh, victims. <laughs> so, mm. so like just knowing um, some of the things that happen, I'm like, eh, it might not be a perfect fit for like me. a wood chipper. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was exactly what's <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> I don't remember being too grossed out by the wood chipper, and I'm pretty easily grossed out in real life. Well, and, like, I I love um, Drop Dead Gorgeous, and that's incredibly dark humor. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a very dark humor. I know, movie. right? But it's so funny. <laughs> God, it's God so damn nice sons too. of bitches. Like, peak. <laughs> <laughs> Lazy sons of bitches, that's it. <laughs> I love that. They don't make movies like that They anymore. do not. They do not. A beauty queen being pushed around in her wheelchair from her struggle with eating disorders, lip syncing, don't cry out loud. Like, that would not be. Yeah, no, it was just it, so. It's dark. It, it pulled no punches. <laughs> no. And well, and like you were saying while we were watching that, you were like, there is so much happening. I'm like missing things. Like, the yes. jokes layer on jokes layer on jokes layer on. Like, that is a movie for multiple viewings because there's just something to be missed while you're, like, absorbing and laughing at something else. Like, it is, it's very dense. Yeah. Like, um, Hot Fuzz. Oh, hot I fuzz love Hot Fuzz. Oh, that. it's so funny. You miss so many jokes because yes. you're laughing at other jokes. Yes. Oh, man, I love that one. Andrew and I rewatched that one quite a bit. I love that Got one. Got it. Yeah, yeah, we do. We, really do. <laughs> we need to make a list. But anyway, but the third thought. Okay, third thought. I thought that was the third thought. No, no, that was the finishing of the second thought. Oh, shucks. The third thought. This is what ADHD is. <laughs> Numbering your thoughts and, like, waiting for one of them to wander back to you. <laughs> Being like, I know it exists. I know it's gone. Okay, I will know it exists. It, and it. then I just let it go. I'm just like, oh, no. okay. She's in the woods now. <laughs> like... <laughs> no i'm too much of a control freak i'm like no 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 i know it's gone i'm i'm i shall wait god there was there was a while that like i knew i was like i couldn't remember the specific word that i wanted to use in like a paragraph of my book and like i could have just deleted this paragraph and been on my way but i waited a month until this word came back to me wow oh my god and i can't remember what it was now but I have it written down somewhere. That is, wow. Well, even like you um, in Night and Shade, like walking away from that draft because you were at that pivotal scene and you hadn't figured out how to like do it. Like if I walk away from it, I'm just going to start working on something else and not come back to it. So that's part of the reason why I leave notes and I like leave half finished like chapters and stuff like that. Because if I don't get to the end, I won't come back to it. It will just go into the pile with all the other unfinished manuscripts. See, I know if I have a thought and then I've forgotten it, I know it's not. Like, I'm either going to wait till, like, the neurons that connected to make that thought happen spark up again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I deja vu myself. and be like, oh, that's a good idea. Again. You know, like, I'm going to, like, either it's going to strike twice or it's not going to happen. Like, I, if I wander away from a draft, I think I really take that time to come back to it with new eyes like i have no i have no memory of this place i've never been here before <laughs> oh oh that's good writing who wrote that <laughs> hello me <laughs> <laughs> it's so narcissistic but it's so funny. um no there is something delightful to being like i wrote that me it was so oh i'm so sexy i'm so, se I'm so sexy um yeah Fun. mika and i were talking and she like quoted one of my lines to me I'm like that's really good i should write that she's like you did <laughs> that's good i'm stealing it she's like no no no, no, no. I, no come back i here. quoted it's it already yours. <laughs> so come back here come back here <laughs> you don't have to pay for that that's hilarious um Okay, okay, let me finish the third thought. Yay, been, she's been she on came hold. back. <laughs> on the topic of having a premise, fulfilling promises, mm -hmm. it's about knowing what your genre promises to your reader. Yes. And really understanding that. Like, the topic of conversation this week has been whether or not people should read the genres they're writing in. Really? That's been a topic and of conversation? That's been a topic of conversation. <laughs> Some people believe 
No, you don't have to know what you're writing about. I, which, I, okay, I don't want to judge anyone. <laughs> mm, I want to judge I'm people. feeling pretty judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 come with me. Come with me. We're going to be mean. Okay, go ahead. I will, I will be mean with you. It's really fucking stupid. It is. You're like wandering around in the dark. <laughs> it, and like, okay. And, and you're like, no one's ever done this before. While well, like 10 people who've done it before are staring at you. And like, or excuse me. you're not putting an ATA at the end of romance because you won't be defined by that convention. And it's like, you just didn't write romance, you a-hole. And now you promise something yeah, to like, a readership that they read romance for the ATA, among other things. But that's like one of the things. Yeah, once a week that people say, I'm going to write a romance and I'm just not going to write a happily ever after. And then it's like, Get out. Oh, why are people mad at me? And it's like, because you made a mistake. Because you, made, you, you didn't you, know you the people you were. You set up a promise are... by marketing yes. a romance and then you didn't fulfill. And so, yeah, people are mad. It's like when Hollywood markets a movie as a comedy because there's a certain actor or actress in it and it's a drama. <sighs> like, and it's like a really like heart wrenching drama, like that happened to me yeah. um, with Family Stone. Oh, I love that movie. I I am forever I traumatized know, because like, and my friend's mom had just passed away from cancer. Like things that should have been said out loud before I sat in the movie theater. Like this is this is my point though. Like you're making a promise. And then you're not fulfilling that promise. And that doesn't make you edgy and cool. It makes you an asshole. It doesn't make you smart. Yeah, no, it just makes you someone who didn't read the rules and thinks, like, like it, it's it's annoying as a reader and it's annoying, yeah. And there are writers, ways to subvert the genre that work for the readership, which is why you need to- Which is why Knives Out is so good. <laughs> yes, so because true. Because it's such a subversion. Oh! Of- time-honored murder mystery yes. tropes yes oh yes. my god yes. so good oh like like if we ever talk about knives out i just want to talk about because i'm such a my mom's such a big murder mystery fan so i have watched every murder mystery in existence <laughs> let me tell you real quick we're so over time yeah i know T- Austin, tight 31 um, showed me <laughs> no, 30 minutes tight 60 tight 60 <laughs> uh Austin showed me the trailer for uh, Murder Murder on the Nile. Okay, okay. Because the, the trailer just dropped. And I was like, oh my god, I love it. Because he knows I love Hercule Poirot. Uh-huh. And so then we finished watching it, and I turn to him and I go, you want to know who dies? Because <laughs> he, he's like, no. And I'm like, well, I've seen this, the BBC version, like a hundred oh. times. It's good. Let me tell you how it ends. And he's like, the trailer just dropped. Like, you cannot do this to me. <laughs> Uh, and then that it's like not the same thing, but kind of the same thing. So Andrew and I were watching a show on Netflix that like was very gripping in the first couple episodes. And I, Mm. I was like totally about it. Right. And then it's getting to the last episode, last couple episodes. And Andrew is like, I'm really done. And I'm like, I'm really done too, but now I have to know. Right. I have to know if like my, my premonitions are correct. Right. So we're watching it and like, I'm like, this is what I think is going to happen. And then it didn't happen. And I was like, okay, all right, red herring. Nope, not a red herring. Okay. And like, I'm throwing out all these different plot points. And normally I'm really good at this. But the stupid ass show, the the stupid show was like, what's the lamest thing we could possibly do? Oh, our subversion. Like, no, no, no. This was so bad. It was so bad. It was like, the guy escaped his murderers and then went back to the reason why he got captured in the first place instead of going then, home. Like, this dude has been locked up, has just like gotten a new breath of life. And they're like, well, he would get a really bad, a- like he'd get really angry and, you know, he'd lose his head. That wasn't shown once. That was not shown once. And it didn't make any sense that he was like, I'm going to go to this person's house. And be like, why did you write these things about me? And then this other person's coming out of nowhere and just killing him. <laughs> like, it didn't make any sense. It was so bad. And so all of the different things I threw out there, Andrew's like, that would have been a lot better. Yeah, they should have done that. <laughs> like, it was just, 
the worst subversion of the genre. Again, just not... They they didn't lay the, the groundwork for that to work, and... See, I was sitting here like, you know what would be a really cool... Like, I'm listening to you say this, uh-huh. and I'm like, oh, so he escapes his murderers, and then, like, he trips and falls and accidentally kills himself, and then everyone still, like, blames it on the people who tried to murder him, because, <laughs> um, like, I think that would be a brilliant... Um, that subversion of the murder mystery. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that would. I mean, but just some random murderer came out of nowhere. Well, not random. It was like she's been barely set up. She's been um catfishing women. One of the women commits suicide, and it's all very weird. She catfished them with like his picture, and then her husband like he comes back and he's like this is her coworker that she used his picture and he like l- like is released from the like he gets out of his cage and then is released from the the would be killer right hmm. and then instead of going home where he hasn't been and he has two kids and a wife and like all of this stuff he's like no i'm gonna confront this lady right here right now i'm hella dehydrated (laughs) and so he goes to her house and then her husband comes up behind him and hits him in the head and it's like it was also weirdly like she catfished because she didn't have kids was weirdly like the undertone and he has these model trains because they don't they never had kids was it it was all like they're very lame because they don't have children was the undertone it was all very weird (laughs) Mm. not good at all and then i mean just so so many terrible things so many terrible things but yeah so it was just like an experience of like they really they really did the worst job they could do they did such a bad job I didn't even see it coming. Like, and not at all in a good way. Like, I love a surprise, like, twist ending, like, Knives Out. Yeah, the the reason the twist in Knives Out works is because it makes you think you know everything. Yes. But then it also, like, is still supported by the foundation laid in the, sh- in the movie. Right? Mm-hmm. So... When yeah. the twist comes in, you're like, you're not, you're not blindsided because they didn't lay the foundation. They laid the foundation in such a subvertive way, such a sneaky way that it works. Were you going to, did I interrupt your third? No, the third, the third thought was just. Don't be an asshole. It's it's not don't be an asshole. It's don't be presumptuous. Don't be pretend, not pretentious. It's okay to be a little pretentious. I, I mean, it has to be pretension all the time. Yeah, I was gonna say it has to be okay to be pretentious because, like, here I am. But... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> not you. I was literally meeting me. Oh, okay. okay. You're so pretentious. You didn't even know I'm pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. It's no. It's. Don't presume you know everything mm-hmm. once you walk into a room. Like, you know, yeah. take your time to really get to know things and always be open to the fact that you can learn more. And also, if you want people to read what you're writing, know who's going to read it. Know who you're writing it for. Also, just you will run out of things to say if you presume you know everything. Yeah. Don't let anything new in. Okay, that's it. That's all I got. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Um, (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Okay, you can find Kate at. Oh, we have to do this. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Romance Writers Therapy. Um, we didn't say that at the beginning. We just no writers therapy. Uh, because you tricked me (laughs) into doing the intro, even though my mother likes it when you do it. You don't think that was my amazing subversion? I mean, it was pretty amazing. Also, I'm very gullible, so don't take too much credit in it. Okay. 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 Kate, I'm going to do this like a professional. God damn it. Okay. Okay. So thank you for listening to Romance Writers Therapy. You can find Kate at by Kate Fryer on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, her Pretty much everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Her romance novella, Love, Laugh, Lich, is available to read. And then you can find me at Marty the Author on TikTok and Instagram. 
And on the Twitter, I am at author Marty, Marty V. And you can join my newsletter at MartyV.com. You can also join Kate's, but she's not doing them yet. I have three subscribers to my newsletter, and I was shocked to find that Way people to had go. subscribed to me. Are they subscribing because they love your voice? I don't know. Oh my god, I bet they are. Listener, it's you, isn't it? You made three different email accounts and now she's like, I'm just gonna subscribe. I'm gonna do it. Your mom needs to stop stalking me, quite frankly. You know what? Could she could she read my newsletter? With her three different could she email do accounts? that? <laughs> Here she I don't is. know. I don't. I've never met your mom. Just waiting I'm on give, doing horrible slander. <laughs> waiting on bated breath for you to send out a newsletter, and mine are just sitting in her inbox. <laughs> All right, because you can tell that she can't. Yeah, open I can. When she doesn't open. It's just that's amazing. I know. <laughs> it's everything in me now. Every month, like mom, you have to actually open it and read it. Hey, mom. <laughs> mom, I can see you not. I can my see. Mail. I know you're just letting my phone ring. <laughs> I know it. You know when your mom doesn't answer your phone call? She knows all my texts. You know, in all of high school, it was like, why aren't you answering your phone? Why do you even have a cell Mm -hmm. phone if you're not going to answer my texts? And it's like, mom, you don't answer mine. Yeah, I know. As a mom, like, I know she has other things going on, you know? But as her daughter, I'm like, what the hell are you doing, lady? Answer your phone. (laughs) Like, it's completely bananas. But, listener, mom, we love you.